Welcome to the Kingdom Current broadcast. I am your host, Pastor Nathan Branham. The Kingdom Current exists to equip the body of Christ with a prophetic edge in the word and a kingdom view on culture. This is episode number 21 and the fourth in the series, Gifts of the Holy Spirit, Discovering Your Gifts. Today, we're going to tie up any loose ends regarding the gifts of the Holy Spirit, exegete the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which intersects both with the discussion of baptism into Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to compare and contrast those two. And the category of gifts found in Romans 12 described as the gifts of the Father. That was a mouthful, but our hope is that your heart will be full with the truth and grace of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as we embark on this edition of the Kingdom Current. Let's go. Welcome once again to the broadcast, and as every good military period of instruction does, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, tell you, then I will tell you what I told you. That is to say, I'm going to provide a little direction for our broadcast today. Here's where we are going. I am going to remind you of the why of studying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is so important. Then we're going to thoroughly examine how to discover and develop your specific individual gift. And then finally, we're going to exegete, that is explain and expound the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and maybe get into chapter 13. Lord willing, pray for me. We'll see if we can do this. But first, heard from Corey in Virginia, And he said, and I quote, I have been praying for the gift of the word of knowledge and three days straight, God has given me something with that. Thanks for being part of that, unquote. No, Corey, thank you so much for being a faithful listener and a supporter of the Kingdom Current. We cannot do this without you. And we would love to hear from you. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. You can go to our website, thekingdomcurrent.com. Also, you can email us at kingdomcurrent94 at gmail.com. And for inquiring minds, the 94 is the year that I was born again. Also, you can check us out on social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Tumblr, and many more. Just probably go on one of those social media platforms and it will kind of connect you to the rest. So why are we studying the gifts of the Holy Spirit? So glad that you asked. And uh, hopefully now by episode four of this series, you're getting tired and you already know all the answers. But here is the skinny, here is the simple answer. That is, we want to be obedient to the Spirit and truth. We want to obey God in his word. And he said in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. At the end of that chapter, as I have quoted many, many times now, that in verse 31, that he wants us to earnestly desire the best gifts. And how do we do that? How do we discover the gifts that God has intended for each one of us. Because what we found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that there are, in verse 4, it says, a diversity of gifts, which we have covered, all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we won't rehash all those here. Please listen to the first three episodes. But there are also differences of administration and there are differences or diversities of operation. That means that these gifts look different in everybody's life Although it is the same spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 7, it says the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That means that God wants us to benefit by them. And we have just recently come through Christmas. I don't know when you're listening to this, but you can imagine that on Christmas, gift giving in the place of Jesus ascending on high, giving gifts to men and the very fact of Jesus's birth 
He was that gift of that baby in the manger. And what greater thing, what greater excitement can we have than tearing open these gifts and receiving them and employing them? But how do I discover it? Well, you have been taking the first steps as you listen to these broadcasts. You are receiving the truth and information and testimony about what they are and about how they operate. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. This is in regards to any area of truth and specifically in the area of spiritual abilities and gifts. As we know them, they are activated as they are revealed to us. So that's step one. You've already begun to investigate, to study, and to know about your gift. So how do you discover your gift? First, revelation. Second is desire. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And this relates to gifts directly in this way. I have found that the gifts I like, the gifts I desire, the gifts that I am attracted to are typically and generally the gifts that God wants to activate in me. Why does God do that? Because God is a wise master builder. He's a wise creator. He knows that if he wants to give us something, that it's probably best if we desire it. That The best gifts on Christmas are those that maybe even we didn't think we wanted, but we got them. We're like, man, this is awesome. So God knows that desire is one of the best ways to lead us into discovering our gifts. What is the gift that you say, man, I really love this gift? I've shared this before, but I'll share it again here, that several of my mentors, and actually I haven't even had several, a couple of my mentors possess gifts that I desire, gifts that attract me, gifts that I say when I see them in operation, I wish God would use me like that. I've shared with you the story of Jeff Bigby, who was one of the earliest mentors in my Christian life, uh, specifically in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he operated in the gift of the word of wisdom, the gift of the word of knowledge, and the gift of prophecy. When he would pray for people, he would say things and call out things and see things in the spirit realm that only that person and God knew. And he prayed that for me many times. There was one time that I took him to uh, a church. This is while I was uh, ministering at the homeless shelter at the time. And so I, I took him back up to Michigan to minister at the church I was raised in, the Assemblies of God church that I was raised in. They were having like this Friday evening worship service and they asked him to come. So he came in and uh, he was ministering to different people. He walks up to this girl that we knew very well. She had spent a lifetime of dancing. Uh, she was in her teens, late teens, she was young, but she had been dancing most of her life. And he walks up straight way to her and he says, I see dancing shoes. <laughs> and then he begins to, to move into what he felt God was saying. But I was so attracted to that because what I saw in those words of knowledge, in the word of wisdom, in the gift of prophecy, was it opened people's heart up to the reality of God. I know what it did for my life. I know that it just caused me even more as I read through the scripture, as, as I serve God, when God would gift me with a word of knowledge to me, it would cause me to know that God was aware of me and God loved me and God was real and God was there almost like nothing else. Now, of course, there's a word of caution there. We want to find that first in the word of God. This is one of the roadblocks to practicing gifts of the Spirit properly. We want to always start with the Word of God. The Word of Wisdom, Word of Knowledge should just be an echo of the Scripture, but more on that later. So if you are desiring a specific gift, it's a good indicator, now not the only indicator, but a good indicator that God wants to use that gift in your life. He wants that to be the regular course of your life to experience these gifts. Well, what is the second thing I need to do when I desire? Ask. Maybe you desire the gift of faith or you desire the gift of the working of miracles. You need to ask. And you say, well, I have already asked. Well, that's good. Have you asked in faith? Have you continued to ask in faith and remind you? Of course, you're just really reminding yourself of God's faithfulness. 
But Jesus told us in Mark chapter 11 and verse 24, Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. That is the prayer of faith. And so let's do that right now. What gift do you desire? The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that we have covered to this point, what gift do you desire? The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, faith, gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. What gift do you desire? That is what you need to pray about. So, Father, we touch and agree concerning this gift that is on the heart, the mind, and is is the desire of your child right now, your son or your daughter, that's on the other side of this speaker listening. God, I'm asking in Jesus' holy name that you would fan the flame of desire even more for the gift that you desire for them to have, and that, God, right now we ask for the thing we desire. So, God, would you grant me, would you grant them this particular gift as they vocalize it right now to you if they're able Grant them this gift. And now, God, we we don't hope, we don't even look for longing for this gift. We receive it by faith because you told us here in Mark 11, 24, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So, God, we thank you right now for the gift that they have asked for because it's your will. You want for us to have this gift more than we want it. We thank you for the gift of the word of wisdom, the gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of discerning of spirits, the gift of faith, the gifts of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of interpretation of tongues. And we say in Jesus' name, amen. The other gift that I saw in operation that caused me to desire it was the gift of the word of wisdom. And I'm going to add to this the ministry and office gift of apostle. Uh, The mentor, Pastor Doug Boquist, that I've shared with you in previous broadcasts about, he just, he spoke as the oracles of God, but he had a tremendous gift of an apostle. He had a, and, and by apostle, I mean someone that is sent by God, but also that has a father's heart. He has a shepherding heart. You say, well, that's a pastor. Yes, but, but a true apostle possesses a heart that is fathering, nurturing, and leading. And he just had this amazing, uncanny ability to walk into any group of leaders and and just lead them. It was amazing. So those are some of the gifts that I have seen exampled and demonstrated, and I have desired, therefore, I have prayed, asked, received, and have operated in. That is how we begin to discover our gifts. So we've had revelation of the gifts. We have desired the gifts. Let me add this under desire, which I've already said, but just to make it very clear, is that you need someone to mentor you in these gifts. And so here is the third way that we can discover our gifts, is that through mentorship and relationship, that's key, is we can have hands laid upon us to receive these gifts. Whatever gift you desire, find somebody that is legitimately and with integrity operating in them and ask them to lay hands on you to receive this gift. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Paul told Timothy Don't neglect the gift, but we're concerned with how did he get this gift? It was given by the laying on of hands. We know that Timothy was Paul's protege. Timothy was Paul's understudy. And Paul laid hands on him to receive the gift of an evangelist, to receive the gift of pastor-teacher. That is how he received it. And in the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, he reminded him of that, 2 Timothy 1.6. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. How do I discover my gift? Get in relationship with somebody that is experienced with the gift. Watch how they do it. Ask how they do it. Ask them if they will teach you. And then ultimately ask them to pray for you 
And God wants to impart this gift through a teaching elder, a mentor. Why? Because our walk with God is all about primarily first relationship with him and then relationship with one another. But what mentorship also provides us is accountability in the gifts, which we all need. We need wide spaces so that we can practice and, yes, fall down, skin our knees, make mistakes. We need all of that, but a mentor can help us, just like Paul mentored Timothy. And once you find a mentor, it's more than likely they will have a community in which they are practicing these gifts, and so you join them in that community. You say, well, I'm not around anybody that's practicing these things. Well, you really don't have any excuses anymore because all you have to do is go to YouTube and just type in demonstrating the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not only can you get more teaching like this, you can find people practicing, people out in the streets. You can find debates on these things that that are talking about the Scripture and what they mean and how they operate, all of these things you can find there is very little room now for excuse for you not to employ your gift. And that's the last thing. Begin to practice and employ these gifts. You say, well, I didn't feel anything. Did you ask in faith? If you asked in faith, feeling has no place. Feeling follows faith. So you have to take the step and employ it. So if if you, for example, desire the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom, that means You have to step out and offer what you feel God is saying about or to some person. You have to be able to have the boldness to say, may I pray for you? And then you share with them what you see. And by see, I mean mental pictures and images. On that note, I want to mention this, that as we were going through the gifts, I told you, I've told you many times now that I like to operate in the gift of the word of knowledge, word of wisdom. The way that that manifests sometimes is I'm actually seeing mental images of the word of knowledge and word of wisdom. So now, is that always the way that it happens? No. A lot of times I actually just get one word. One word will come to mind and that's it. But there are different ways. As we've said, there's different gifts, there's different administrations, there's different manifestations, there's different ways that this happens. But when you get around this, this community, when you're watching on YouTube, when you're, when you're talking to your mentor, they will show you how this works, but you've got to employ it. This is the last way I think that you can discover your gift out of the four different ways that you can discover your gift that I've shared is that you have to employ. There's got to be some time that you actually put it to work. Proverbs 17, 8 says this, A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that has it. Wherever it turns, it prospers. I do want to acknowledge something before I share the other verse in Proverbs that mentions a gift. You say, well, pastor, the word gift there actually can mean bribe. It could actually mean like a physical gift. And I would say you're absolutely correct. But it can also mean anything of value that you can give. A gift is a gift is a gift, whether it's Holy Spirit or whether it's wrapped under the tree on Christmas. A gift is as a precious stone. He's saying it's something valuable. And notice, wherever it goes, it prospers. So along with having mentorship and having hands laid on you, here is the benefit of practicing and searching and seeking to operate in the gifts in community. So when you are employing this gift, when you are practicing it, you can be in a community that will see, hey, you're good at this. Hey, I see something in your life that maybe you're not seeing. So when you employ your gift in community with mentors, and you've, again, this is part of the laying on of hands, it's the community thing, it's relationship, is they may see something in you that you don't even realize, or maybe you just need confirmation and encouragement to keep moving forward. Perspective, outside perspective, sometimes can help us discover the gift that maybe we're not aware of. But now back to Proverbs 17, 8, is that I share this because 
whatever gift that the Holy Spirit has birthed in you, eventually it's going to come out. It's going to prosper. And then one chapter over in Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 16, listen, it says something similar. It says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. I use this verse oftentimes to encourage people in regards to the gift, in regard to their calling, to just hop in somewhere, anywhere, and serve. Because whatever you're called to do, it will rise to the top. Your gift, listen, it said, your gift will make room for you. So, for example, you say, well, I feel like I'm called to be a leader. Well, if they try to put you in some role where it's purely service, guess what's going to happen? If you truly do have a gift to lead, you are going to be organizing those that are serving. If you have a gift to serve and they say, hey, we want you to lead, guess what's going to happen? You're always going to go to the lowest place and just try and serve. You won't make a good leader. Do you see how that works? If you are called to teach, They may put you in the kids' class, and maybe you feel like, well, I want to be a lead pastor. I want to be a teaching elder in church, but they're putting you in the kids' class. Guess what? You're going to be a tremendous teacher, and they're going to say, man, did you see Corey is a great teacher? His gift will make room for him. It will flourish wherever you place it. So do you see how this is working? First off is revelation. We always start at truth. That's why you're listening to these broadcasts. Second is desire. Desire is an indicator that that is the gift God is revealing, developing, and depositing in you. Then you need to ask for it. And then you need to have hands laid on you, which involves and includes mentorship and community. This is all about relationship. Your gift will develop well in community. And finally, There's got to be a time where you step out of the boat and you try it. When we were covering words of knowledge, I shared with you that when that group of guys came into the Starbucks there at Bowling Green University, the word teeth went right through my, my head and I thought, that was that God or just me? But I stepped out of the boat and tried it. I thought, well, if I look like an absolute fool, well, I'll tell them Jesus loves them and I'll never, I will never see them again. However, If it was God and God meets them where they're at, it's going to blow their socks off. And guess what? It blew their socks off, and they know there is a God in heaven. So you have to get your gift out of the boat. You have to get this gift moving forward. And then also just continue to pray, continue to seek, desire earnestly the best gifts. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, here's the promise, you will be filled. All right, I hope that really, really helps you. Now, I want to turn our attention to the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We covered up through verse 11, and now we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Let's unpack this text and see what it has to say about the gifts. And just so you know, as we go through this, I am going to get into a bit of detail, some kind of fine detail, and maybe some more academic shop talk. Please don't be turned off by it. If nothing else, if you say, this is a little outside of my league, that's okay. Just listen, because here's what, here's what you're going to find out, that what I discuss are ideas that are related to this topic that maybe you just haven't thought through or got to in your thinking, processing, and meditating on this issue. Here's something, though, that may actually happen as as you're talking about these things and in practicing them and discussing them, someone will bring these issues up. And maybe right now you won't be too interested, but eventually you say, hey, I remember Pastor Nathan talked about this on the Kingdom Current. Let me just pull this back up here and see what he said about it. So with that out of the way, please just stick with me, stay tuned, and you'll see what I'm talking about here relatively quickly. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, and FYI, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation, and I'm doing that because I was in the New King James. I just think this, the NLT, makes it a lot clearer, a lot simpler, and easy to understand. Look what it says. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body, 
So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by the Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. Okay, stop there. Paul, in talking about the gifts, uses this metaphor of a body here in 1 Corinthians 12, but also in Romans 12, which we'll talk about in a moment. But before we get there, I I want to discuss the difference between the baptism in the Holy Spirit and baptism into Christ. There are some people that say they are the same thing, and there are others like me that say, They are two separate things. Let me see if I can demonstrate this for you. And by the way, if you think they're the same thing, it's okay. At the end of the day, it's okay. The important thing is that you're baptized into Christ. Okay, what is Paul talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13? He says, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Paul is talking about the salvation experience when we are described as being baptized into Christ. This is the baptism of your spirit. It is a picture, a word picture. Baptism comes from the word baptizo, which means to fully immerse. When I got saved, it is described as my spirit being born again and Christ living on the inside of me and baptizing my spirit with his. Now, we're going to leave this text only to demonstrate the baptism in Christ and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. There's a reason we're doing this because the baptism with the Holy Spirit is something that I am claiming that I believe the scriptures show us is something we receive after we get saved. And the reason this is important is because some people say, well, if, if I'm saved, why do I need anything more? My response would always be this, if Christ has more to give, why wouldn't I want it? And I think most of us would, would answer that way. Just like you, if you pray the disciples or the Lord's prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Well, if I have Christ, why do I need to ask for it? You get the picture. There is always more in Christ. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that we can get low. We have to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3.26, look what it says. This is talking about being baptized into Christ for salvation. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul is talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 and Galatians 3.26 of being saved. When I got born again, it's also described as being baptized into Christ. We see this again. So we have all of these witnesses. He's building a case. Ephesians 4.4, look what this says. There is one body. What body is that? The body of Christ, correct. And one spirit. That's right, the Holy Spirit. Even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, who is that? Jesus, yes. There's one faith, that's the faith of Christ, and one baptism. What baptism is he talking about? The baptism into Christ. Verse 6, one God and Father of all who is above all and through you all and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So these verses clearly set out that when I am saved, my spirit is baptized in to Christ. This, however, is not the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's different. Some people describe this teaching of the difference between the baptism into Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the doctrine of subsequence. I know big term, but this is all that it means is that once I am baptized into Christ, that is, Christ lives in me for purity and holiness, I am saved, my sins are forgiven, Christ comes in me for salvation, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a subsequent, that is, secondary, it comes after, that's the definition of subsequence, it comes after I am baptized into Christ, listen, 
and the Holy Spirit comes upon my life for power. I'm baptized into Christ at salvation for purity of spirit, but then I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit for power to serve. That is the difference. Now, can I demonstrate that? Yes. Let's go all the way back very quickly to the book of Luke. And we're going to see that Jesus talks about subsequence to his disciples. That is, there is a another work of the Holy Spirit in addition to salvation, and it's called the promise of the Father, i.e. the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And again, if you just tuned in and you say, I don't believe in subsequence, that's okay. Please don't throw out everything else. You know what I'm learning as I get, I think, a little bit more mature is I know how to eat the meat and spit out the bones. If I don't agree with somebody on every point, I try to hear Christ in all of it. And if I get a little bit of mixture, something I just disagree with opinion, or maybe it's just the guy, or maybe even sometimes the enemy gets in there, I just say, God, I I trust your truth. And this is what your word says. And I agree, I'm going to eat that meat and spit out the bones. And if it gets too bad, maybe I need to address the speaker afterwards. But you hear, hear my heart. I want you to receive everything that God has for you. Now, we're all the way back in the Gospels, Luke 24 and verse 47. Look what it says. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The disciples were already saved. The disciples had the Spirit of God living on the inside of them, but Jesus said, you need to be endued with power for what reason? So that you can be my witnesses. You have to have this additional experience of my Holy Spirit in your life to empower you to go out now to quell some of the fears and responses that I can hear in my heart. You need to know this. Some people receive both works at the same time. Some people receive the baptism into Christ, that means getting saved, Christ inside for purity, and they're baptized into the Holy Ghost. They receive the power from on high to endue them and equip them for service at the time of salvation. But what we see in the book of Acts is that there is a secondary work from being baptized into Christ. And this is where we see it. In Luke chapter 24, we see Jesus equating the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the promise of the Father, which is the promise of power from on high to enable them to go be witnesses. So go now, fast forward. So Jesus has ascended to the Father, or he's about to ascend to the Father here in Acts chapter 1. Look what it says, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Go down to verse 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's in fact what happened. So follow this. The disciples were saved. Jesus tells them, go and wait for power. They go and they wait, they're endued, the Spirit falls, tongues of fire, they speak in other languages, the the Jews in Jerusalem hear them, they interpret them, they're saying the wonderful works of God, they go and they evangelize, and people are being one, and of course 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, clearly a second work in addition to. And again, if you disagree with me, can I just ask you, If God has more to give you, would you want to receive it? If God has more to give you, or rather, if God doesn't have more to give you, then don't ask him for daily bread. Don't ask him to fill you anymore because you've got it all. But one thing I've found out about people that think they have it all is when they think they stand, they fall. When they think they're full, they're really empty. When you think you see, when you think you're rich, you're really poor, naked, blind, and wretched. God has more to give you, and that's not a rebuke. That's just an encouragement. I just want you to see it. I want you to have everything that God has for you. Now, moving on in Acts, I don't have time to cover every time that the Holy Spirit baptized people, and we saw this through Acts. There are at least three instances 
wherein after salvation came, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they knew, this is where the Pentecostal doctrine comes from, they knew they were filled because they spoke with tongues. It was the initial physical evidence. This is where the assemblies of God base their doctrine of Pentecostalism on. The initial physical evidence is when you speak in tongues. I told you that I was raised in that denomination, nearly half a billion people practicing and celebrating the reality of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I have shared with you that my stance is just a bit softer. I believe that you'll do one of three things, if not all of them, or a combination, because we see this in the book of Acts. They spoke with tongues primarily, but they also spoke the word of God with boldness, and they had joy. Those are three things that I don't know why you wouldn't want them. I want them. You're either going to speak in tongues, speak the word of God with boldness, and be filled with joy. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the power to evangelize is you have joy. The world has its counterfeits. The world has every false delusion of joy, and it's not the real thing. Publisher's Clearing House, I think, is the greatest delusion of joy and happiness that there ever was. But I guarantee that if Ed McMahon, or now I think it's Steve Harvey, but if Steve Harvey came knocking at your door at 9 a.m. in the morning with a big fat check of, I don't know, whatever it is, $100,000 for every month the rest of the days of your life, I guarantee you, you would have joy. You'd grab Steve Harvey, having never met him, gave him a hug, probably a sloppy kiss on the lips and say, I love you, Steve. And you'd go on like a crazy man or a crazy woman. Why? Because you just won the lotto. But ladies and gentlemen, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the eternal, the holy, the things that are true are so much more desirable than money. Joy is a wonderful evidence. True joy is a wonderful evidence that I have have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let me show you the primary text that teaches and demonstrates that there is a second subsequent work of Holy Spirit baptism of the promise of the Father in the life of the Christian. Look at Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said to them, Unto which were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. So they were believers in Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so they were saved. They had the public testimony of baptism in water which, by the way, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We've already shown you that from Ephesians 4. What place does water baptism have? Water baptism is confirming the spiritual baptism in Christ. So let's continue. This is Acts 19 and verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So there's the tongues, and they prophesied. That means they spoke the word of God with boldness. Two of the three signs, but I guarantee they had joy. And all the men were about 12. This is why we say there is more for you in the faith. There is more revelation from the word of God. There are more gifts than what you began with. There is more in God. I believe that we will never stop receiving from him for the rest of eternity. There's so much more in God. So that is the difference between baptism into Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did you see it? I hope that wasn't too confusing. I hope I made that clear enough. But if I didn't, let me just recap what I said. That according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, let me quote it again. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. This is talking about being saved and pictured by the word baptism immersed into the spirit of Christ. When you are born again, another picture, your spirit is born anew. 
Jesus comes to live on the inside of you and he bathes, he baptizo, he fully immerses your spirit in himself. That is salvation. Christ at salvation comes into you for purity And after you're saved, there is an additional work where the Holy Spirit baptizes you and power comes upon your life and enables you to witness for his sake. That is the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being baptized into Christ at salvation. Well, let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14, getting now into the body metaphor. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a body part. Now, here is a major roadblock to you operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And just a reminder, we are going to cover in an entire episode what I feel body-wide is a major roadblock to the practices of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that is the doctrine of cessationism that many high-level, highly respected Bible teachers and pastors hold to and and nearly uh, whole denominations hold to that I believe is not correct. We're going to cover that roadblock But Paul talks about a major roadblock here in verse 15. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. He goes on to say, and if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies having many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. The New King James says, where it pleases him. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Stop there. A lot to cover here. But one of the major roadblocks to you operating in your gift is comparing your gift and how it works in your life to others. And by that comparison, either putting them down or putting you down. Because as I just read to you in verse 18, it says God has put each part just where he wants it. Does that mean there's no room for improvement? Well, absolutely not. We can grow in faith. We can grow in practice, just like on a body. Perfect metaphor. Here we are. But if you are, if you are constantly comparing the size of your biceps to Hulk Hogan's or to the rocks, okay, I'm joking, but you get the point. If you are comparing them to anyone else, If it's not stirring you in a positive, healthy way, and you are becoming jealous or even contemptuous to those people that maybe are more developed and more grown, you are not going to operate in the gift. So I encourage you, whatever gifts you have or whatever gifts you don't possess, be thankful for the gifts you have and know God can give you more. There was a time where I didn't preach. There was a time I didn't teach. When I started preaching back in 2001, when I got to my first full-time ministry position at the Lima Rescue Mission, I can remember for several years, I felt so inadequate, like there was so much growing I had to do in my preaching. I wanted to do so much more. And I remember just asking and praying. And eventually, I reached those different points of growth because I continue to desire, I continue to ask God, I continue to seek God for these different gifts. So you need to know this, that whatever gift God has for you, you have to put comparison, you have to put jealousy and competition, you have to keep it far from you. You may be an ear. If you are an ear in the body, you have to be content with that sharpen your hearing like nobody else. But listen, if you can develop that one gift better than anybody else, 
that gift will make room for you. I've told you that there were three different gifts list in the scriptures. We've already covered the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but I want to now go to the other gift list that I've mentioned to you several times, and that is the gifts of the Father. So if you go over to Romans chapter 12 and go to verse 6, it says, In his grace, God. Now, of course, that's the Trinity, but we could say that this is the Father. These are the gifts of the Father. Romans 12, 6, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things. So the first one is prophecy, inspired speech, propheteia. We've already looked at this. Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Look at verse 7. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. This is the word that we get deacon from. And if you study this word out, you see that it has much depth. And it has a lot of meaning. Adam Clark said that the synagogue had deacons who were almost like teaching elders, but they served. They would feed people. They were tasked and responsible for many things. So serving is a major gift that the entire world needs. And now as we sit here on the precipice of 2023, I'm just thinking about going through the line at Panera Bread or McDonald's And I can't hardly get a smile out of one of these drive-through workers. It's hard to find somebody. I, I can't believe how much we have taken for granted, but it is so hard to find people to serve and to work. So if God has called you to serve, serve them well. Furthermore, if you're a teacher, teach well. Whatever gift you have, I believe that what it's telling you to do is, yes, to do it well, but also to develop that gift. One of the best ways that I have found to develop the gift of teaching is to listen to good teachers and to copy and to mimic what they do. And you you may say, well, pastor, you just said a little bit ago, we shouldn't copy people. Well, when you're in the process of growth, all you can do is mime. All you can do is do what they do. I mean, that's how we learn, is it not? Think about children. When they're learning how to talk, what do they do? They mimic what their parents show them or whoever's raising them. Uh, When they're walking, they mimic, they follow what they see. There's going to be a time in your growth where you mimic and copy what you are seeing, but ultimately it has to become you and be filtered through the, the true you. Verse number eight of Romans 12, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. So that means that if your gift is exhortation, if you're an exhorter, that you need to be encouraging. That means you need to embolden people. That means you need to lift people. Sometimes these gifts can be turned inside out and become what they're not. And so this simple advice, this simple truth of the gift of encouraging, just encourage people because some people have taken this gift of exhort and they've tore people down because the gift to encourage is using your words to build people up. But the point is you have the ability to speak into others' lives. And if you're speaking into others' lives and tearing them down, you're not an encourager. You're not an exhorter. Be encouraging. Similarly, if your gift is giving, I am so thankful that we have people that give. I like to watch the reels on Facebook. They're just like the short little videos. But my favorite are ones that that they don't even know God. It's clear from their attitude and some of the other things they do and say. But they go out and and they give to people. They they show up and they tip waitresses. They'll, you know, kind of joke around with them, say, I'm not going to give you a tip, and then leave them a $1,000 tip. And these people are blown away. The gift of giving is an amazing gift. It really makes the world go round. Thank God for people that have the tenderness of heart to give to Mercy Missions, to give to the Red Cross, to give to some of these feeding programs that aren't Christian, that are secular. Thank God for the gift of giving. Every Christian should be a giver. Why? Because God's a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. If you're a giver, give generously. We have all been the recipients of somebody with the gift of giving, and thank God for it. Here it goes on. If God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. 
one of the best definitions of leadership that I have ever heard, which, incidentally, I learned at the Global Leadership Summit, which are amazing leadership conferences that are held every year. But leadership is simply influencing others. You say, well, wow, that's pretty broad. Yeah, absolutely. Mom, you're a leader. Dad, you're a leader. Uncle, you're a leader. Aunt, sister, brother, somebody is looking at you. You are influencing someone. You are a leader. Now, some people truly have this gift of leadership. They just have it. And if you have the gift of leadership, here's one thing that's true. It's going to come to the top. People are going to see it. People are going to expect it. People are going to pull it out of you. Why? Because the gift of leadership is rare. What's the, what's the old saying that there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians? Well, it's just, it's just demonstrating the fact that typically for society, for organizations to run properly, you have to have a few leaders over many followers. If you have the gift of leadership, take it seriously. Why? Because it is precious and you need to improve it. Don't forget the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ is different than the world. We practice something called servant leadership. You need not to be a vainglorious alpha male that is a high-powered, highly financed, you know, Rolex watch, all that kind of garbage that is so characterized by the world's leadership. You are not a businessman. You are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He took a towel and a robe and washed the dung-laden feet of his disciples, and he he cleaned their feet, and he served them. We don't lord it over everybody. You should be an example, and you should know how to serve. You should know how to stand in the pulpit, and you should know how to wash a garbage can. That's the kind of leadership I'm talking about. Now, here's the last gift in this gifts list of the Father. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. The gift of kindness may be the gift that causes every other gift to work sweetly. In fact, the next verse, look what it says. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Whatever gift you have, child of God, Would you make sure that you're operating in love? Would you make sure that the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, would you make sure those gifts are operating right alongside your gift of the Holy Spirit? Because rest assured, when you operate in your gift and it's lathered with the love of Jesus Christ, People are going to see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, that is all the time that we have for today. I hope you'll join us next time as we look into the importance of love in relationship to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which will finally lead us to our discussion of cessationism. You don't want to miss it. The Kingdom Current is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Lima, Ohio. You can find out what we're doing in Lima by visiting our website at gfclima.com. Also, please visit our ministry website, thekingdomcurrent.com. There you can download these podcasts, get more information on the ministry, and help support us financially. And we want to thank our listeners. First, those listening on WWNL-FM and their sister AM station in Pittsburgh, God bless you. And those listening in Lima, Ohio on WTTP-FM, thank you so much. If you are a podcast listener, we love you. Continue to download from our website. And of course, you can find us on all these podcasting platforms, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Deezer, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, and in India, Geosavin. And we would love to hear from you. Drop us a line. Let us know how the Kingdom Current is encouraging you. And if you can support us financially, we would be so grateful. It's really easy to do. All you have to do is go to thekingdomcurrent.com, click on the giving tab, and find out how you can give. 
Remember, the Kingdom Current exists to equip you with a prophetic edge in the Word and a Kingdom view on culture.